Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, there's a cast of thousands here. And the reason for that is because I've been working uh, for nine years now on this project, uh, looking at the effects of the BP oil spill. And some of these people are associated with the original uh, NOAA NERDA investigation. The NERDA stands for the Natural Resources Damage Assessment. And so they con contracted a number of us to take a look at what the impact of the spill was immediately. And then, as I'll say uh, later on in the, in the talk as well, we followed that up with our own research proposal for a consortium called Deep End, the deep pelagic necton dynamics of the Gulf of Mexico. And a good many of the folks here are either originally from the NERDA investigation or subsequent uh, investigators in Deep End and grad students who have uh, helped in a good many of these projects. All right, so the Gulf of Mexico is a really large semi-enclosed sea. And it has just a few openings. You can see that uh, here the Yucatan Channel and then the Straits of Florida between Cuba and the Florida Keys. The last compiled list of all of the fishes known from the Gulf of Mexico is this paper by John McEachern in 2009. And he found that there were 1,541 species in the Gulf of Mexico. But one of the things that people kind of overlook is the fact that the Gulf of Mexico is actually a deep sea basin. And so all of those fishes um, that are listed in McEachern are dominated by the shallow water things that are here in that upper 200 meter skin of the, the Gulf. 200 meters is what we consider the epipelagic, and that is the zone in which you know, sunlight is sufficient for photosynthesis and temperatures are fairly warm, and that's where a lot of the surface-dwelling fishes that we're used to thinking about, like tunas and flounders and such, are living up there. Below that 200 meters, you get into the mesopelagic, and that 200 to 1,000 meter depth is a twilight zone where Light is not sufficient for um, photosynthesis, but it's increasingly dimmer as you're going deeper and deeper in the water column. Until you get to about 1,000 meters, in which case all the light is extinguished. And everything below that 1,000 meters is bathypelagic. And what we're going to talk about today are the things that are in the epipelagic, the mesopelagic, and just a little bit of the upper bathypelagic. So, um, I've been reminded by a number of my students that I need to talk a little bit about the history of BP because for my current students, they were in like fifth or sixth or seventh grade when it actually happened and they weren't like real news junkies at that time. <laughs> and so, so what I'm going to do is go through a little bit about the BP oil spill to remind people who were aware of it and to elucidate educate the folks who weren't really paying attention to the news back then. So Deepwater Horizon is actually the name of this rig right here. And this was a semi-submersible deep ocean rig that allowed for drilling in what was the very edge of exploitable uh, continental slope at the time. Um, it's also known as the BP oil spill because BP was the company that had the rights for um, uh, exploring that area and extracting any of the oil that they get. It's also called the Macondo blowout because Macondo was the name of the prospect that they were drilling in. And it's also known as MC-252 because Mississippi Canyon Block 252 was the location of that lease. So you'll see each of those names at times in the, in the literature, in the news, and such. But it's all the same place and the same event. When you take a look at the infrastructure of oil rigs and pipelines in the northern Gulf of Mexico, it is thick out there. there it's not surprising. You, know, you go out of Louisiana and any of those ports, and you are passing rigs all the time, either old defunct rigs or, or currently uh, extracting rigs and such. And Deepwater Horizon is right there, that, that very far edge. 
This was done, this map was made just before the Deepwater Horizon um, exploded. And so this was the cutting edge of deep sea drilling at the time. So in April 20, 2010, uh, there was a methane gas uh, pulse that came up through the, the well and got ignited, and the entire rig exploded. Uh, there was a loss of life. About 11 people are thought to have died. 17 were injured. It was a major disaster. And the rig itself was on fire for days about two and a half days. And the heat of the flames were so intense that actually the rig buckled and sank uh, after two and a half days of burning. As it sank, it took with it the riser. The riser is the pipe that connects the floating rig to the wellhead down on the bottom. And so there were 1,400 feet of riser right there with oil in it when the rig went down. And so the rig fell over, plunged about a half mile away from the wellhead itself is where it landed on the bottom. And the riser, too, was crumpled and leaking oil. And so you had three different sources of oil, the wellhead, the riser, and the rig that was coming to the surface of the water. Well, uh, one of the things that the containment strategy included was getting these vessels like this skimmer boat to go out there, use a boom to encircle some of the oil, and then literally vacuum it up. The skimmers are, are like a, a, a vacuum cleaner that's taking the surface material off of the water. But there was so much oil that not, there were not enough skimmers for them to use. So they started doing what were called controlled burns, where vessels that they contracted, and since the oil spill was putting out of work uh, shrimp fishermen and such, they would get shrimpers contracted out to pull booms and collect a bunch of oil and then burn it. And, and so this is what the Gulf looked like uh, weeks after the spill as they were trying to eliminate all of this material at the surface. Another strategy was to eliminate the oil by dispersing it. Um, there is a natural flora of bacteria in the Gulf of Mexico adapted for eating oil. Oil is percolating up out of the rocks naturally, and so those bacteria feed on oil as their energy source. And the thought was by putting dispersant on, you're creating smaller and smaller droplets of oil that would be more readily available for the bacteria to feed on. And so they thought they could get rid of a lot of oil in this manner. Uh, the dispersants they used were a couple of uh, variants of a, a dispersant known as Corexit. And they used that particular dispersant because it was readily available in large volumes. The company that had been helping with the Deepwater Horizon, Halliburton, uh, actually had large stocks of that on hand. And so they sold it to DP for part of the cleanup. Unfortunately, it was rather untested. And so people were not really aware of what sort of toxicity the Corexit might have or what sort of synergistic um, aspects it would have to the um, mixing with oil and then potentially impacting animals and such. The big deal was, in part, trying to just eliminate the spills and trying to eliminate the oil from getting onto the shoreline. But some of the oil did. Um, oil, when it gets weathered by both light and uh, volatiles that evaporate off of it and, and then churned in the ocean, becomes this sort of thick goo that is frothy. And so it's called moose. And so this is oil moose that's landed into a salt marsh in Louisiana. And there were a number of marshes, especially in Louisiana, but also in Mississippi and Alabama, and uh, the, the panhandle of Florida, that got impacted with moose. So they were very worried about the oil uh, slick spreading 
And part of that was due to an oceanographic feature that occurs in the Gulf of Mexico. There's something called the loop current. The way the Gulf Stream itself, which is running along the east coast of Florida and then out into uh, the, the North Atlantic, that originates with this current that comes from the Caribbean in through the Yucatan Channel. And sometimes that just sort of curves right around through the Straits of Florida and goes up. But other times you get this excursion of the current into the northern Gulf of Mexico. And when it does that sort of big loop and a U-turn at the northern Gulf, that's called the loop current. Now, what will happen very frequently is the current itself will pinch off right here and return to just going along the north coast of Cuba. And what you end up with is this spinning eddy right here. And those spinning eddies, they retrograde to the westward. And so some of these warm core eddies here are old eddies that had spun off of the uh, loop current in years prior. So this was the case for the loop current at the time of the spill. It was not all the way up into northern uh, Gulf of Mexico. This is the outline of the oil spill itself, or at least the thickest parts of it uh, here. And the way the loop current was running at the time, it started pulling a little streamer into it. And there was a lot of concern that that oil was then going to be carried to the west coast of Florida and the Florida Keys and all, possibly the Atlantic seaboard. And so people were very, very worried oceanographically how this could just extend the uh, impacts and damages to other areas. But fortunately, Florida got fairly lucky in all of this. And what happened is uh, later on in the summer, the northern part of the loop current actually pinched off and became an eddy. And as an eddy in the northern part here, it basically set up a blockade for the, the oil to remain in the northern part of the Gulf. And, and so it never actually got anywhere further south than Tampa. And there, there's uh, evidence of traces of oil getting into Tampa Bay and uh, the areas around Clearwater and such, but in lesser amounts than up in the northern part. And so this impact was more contained oceanographically to the northern Gulf than anywhere else. One of the things that BP had decided to do early on was um, all this oil was spewing out of the wellhead. And they thought, well, if we could apply dispersant right at the wellhead, maybe we can make it turn into fine droplets and not actually create a slick at the surface. And so they did just that. That little white probe right there represents the applicator that's putting dispersant directly into the, the oil that's billowing out of the, uh, the wellhead. But the flow rate was really, really large. Um, there were a lot of disputes about what the flow rate was, and initially BP was saying, oh, it's like 1,000 to 5,000 gallons a day. Somebody saw the video of it and could actually track white flecks of material coming through, and when they looked at the distance and the speed and such, they figured out that, oh, actually that wellhead's doing something like 68,000 gallons a day. And... So the amount of, of dispersant they were applying was not sufficient to actually just emulsify and uh, turn into micro droplets all of the oil. And that's one reason why the slick was really large on the surface. I mean, you take a look at those satellite images, and it's hard to get a scale for how extensive the oil slick was. But you can think about it in terms of, of aerial coverage. And it basically was the size of Oklahoma. Oh. So this dispersant is being applied, and over an extended period of time, uh, 770,000 gallons of dispersant applied to the oil directly coming out of the wellhead. And like I said, the theory was you disperse this stuff, it becomes micro droplets, it stays off the surface, microbes can attack it and eat it, and voila, the oil is gone, right? 
Uh, but that's not the way it worked. There was so much oil blowing out of this that there were actually was plenty of it going to the surface and contributing to that really large slick at the surface as well. What was unknown was just how much oil droplets do 770,000 gallons of dispersant create. And what happens to those droplets? So that actually prompted some investigations in the midst of the summer while they're trying to uh, turn off the wellhead and such. And one of the first investigations was just doing CTD casts, which is conductivity, temperature, density. They're taking a look at the water in a continuous profile uh, into deep waters. And one of the things they noticed was, okay, there's oxygen really high at the surface. It drops down uh, normally in around four or 500 meters, becomes what's known as oxygen minimum zone, and then it climbs up again as you go deeper. But right here at about uh, 1,100 to 1,200 meters, they were finding what's known as an oxygen sag, where oxygen is dropping again. That's an indication of large microbial activity, using up oxygen while they're doing something. And there was also um, these red and black lines represent visibility, clarity of the water. And there was something obscuring clarity in the water at those depths. And so they sent down an ROV. What they found is uh, droplets of oil, micro droplets that were visible. Um, I've heard one investigator describe it as a fog in the, in the water column. And that's a really good description. Um, this was a set of photos from an ROV that was only about a mile away from the, um, the wellhead. And so it was anticipated that there were going to be droplets there and you know, potentially obscuring uh, vision and things. There are also conflicting estimates as to how much oil ended up in this deep layer as opposed to at the surface. Um, estimates now stay, say that 50% of the oil actually didn't make it to the surface. That's the low end estimate. There are other estimates that say up to uh, 75%. Now some of that oil was losing lighter elements and dropping down and becoming sort of a tar layer on the bottom. Uh, but a lot of it was also making this plume of micro droplets in the water column. And as people started tracking this with more and more profiles of the water column and such, what they found was that there's a chemical signature for both the oil from the well itself, because it has very particular proportions of constituents in the oil, and some uh, man-made materials that were in the dispersant. And so those two signatures actually showed that there was a river of oil droplets extending from the wellhead itself and ultimately, they lost a uh, trace of the, the um, signature at 256 miles away from the wellhead. And so it was heading southwestwards towards Galveston. And uh, in some places where it was measured, it was really a wide river of oil droplets and uh, a couple hundred meters high. Once NOAA realized that there was this deep water plume of oil droplets, they realized that they also needed to investigate what the damages were to animals down at those depths. And they'd never really done a great deal of work at those kinds of depths before. So they contacted my colleague, Tracy Sutton, and asked him, how would you establish a program to do this kind of investigation? And Tracy said, well, you get nets and you start trawling and pulling up all of the animals that you collect and checking them out and seeing, for instance, if they've got contamination and all sorts of other things. And so he designed a, a research program that would involve initially just one vessel, uh, an available NOAA fisheries vessel called the Pisces, and using a high-speed rope trawl, they did some surveys in December of 2010 and realized that um, this was really good data. This was stuff that, that they really needed to find out more about. 
And so after the first cruise, uh, they again asked Tracy, so what else do you need? And he said, well, what we really need is some sort of discrete depth sampling that would allow us to look at different strata within the, the water column and figure out what's going on at these different depth levels. And so um, this net was rented from a, uh, a university that had it. Uh, this is what's referred to as a 10 meter squared mock nest. The mock nest stands for multiple opening closing net uh, with environmental sensing system. And what this is, is actually not one net, but in this case, six nets attached to the frame. And what you can do is open up one net, use it for a certain depth interval, shut it, open up the next one, use that for a different uh, depth strata, and just work your way back to the surface with that sort of uh, scheme. Using this high-speed rope trawl, has advantages to it because it's high speed. It can run at about four knots, which for fishing is pretty fast. Um, this net actually is, is trawled at about 1.2 knots, which means that it gets slower animals, and it's a much smaller net. 10 meters square is about 10 feet by 13 feet. So this is an opening to the net that's like a, uh, a small dining room or something. The High-speed rope trawl is so large that you could turn the boat around and drive right into it and, and just get captured in the cod end there. Um, so here's a person standing next to a mock nest, and you can see the multiple nets. In this case, this is about ready to be pulled back on board because the last net is uh, the, the one open right here. All the others have shut uh, using a gravity closure. But this gives you a sense of the relative scale. Okay, here's the high-speed rope trawl. That little red circle is the person standing next to the high-speed rope trawl. So it's a huge net, but it allows you to catch bigger, faster um, animals. And so we use that at first, and you can see the difference in the lengths of the different animals that we collected. So uh, this sort of Pink and uh, roseish color is all, all the things captured by the Mach 10, and the purple here is uh, everything by this high-speed rope trawl. And you can see that uh, we're getting mostly small organisms under a meter, so under three feet or so in length with the Mach 10, but going up almost to uh, three meters in length, or over nine feet for the things caught in the uh, high-speed rope trawl. And so here's some examples of some of the bigger animals that we were capable of catching with the high-speed rope trawl. I mean, this is a good-sized squid right there. And April here is holding this Olephosaurus, which is a really fun lizard-like fish that uh, uh, is a deep water predator of so many things. We got jellyfish and this is an obscure little ribbon fish. The Mach 10, though, has its advantages. Even though it's a slower net that uh, catches smaller animals um, that are slower swimmers, it has that discrete depth capability. So we set this up so that the first net just went from the surface all the way down to 1,500 meters, which was about as deep as we were capable of trawling. And then we did an interval of 15 to 1,200, which puts a sample underneath the, the plume. And then 1,000 to 12 is right at the level where the plume was. And then 600 to 1,000 is deep mesopelagic. 200 to 600 is uh, shallow mesopelagic. And then the 0 to 200 is the epipelagic. And so we were able to set up this stratification. Uh, all of the stations that we sampled were basically borrowed from a uh, plankton sampling survey known as CMAP. And so they'd already established these stations, and they were pretty convenient. They're about a half degree uh, latitude and longitude in each direction. So it makes this grid of stations that are about 30 miles apart. So 
the investigation by NOAA persisted until BP um, acquiesced to pay the fines and such. And once that happened, they basically shut down the natural resources damage assessment. Um, so our colleagues and I had anticipated that this was going to end. And so we had already put in a grant proposal to try and continue the sampling program, although on a more limited scale, um, especially with the mock net. And so we were able to get funding to contract this boat, the Point Sur, out of the University of Southern Mississippi. And there's the mock ness with the multiple net cod ends hanging off uh, as it's being all retrieved. And we continued sampling until, let me see, August of 2018. That was our last cruise with the Point Sur. And so what we have is all the sampling that was done in 2010, 2011 with the NOAA NERDA material, and then the deep end material from 2015, 16, 17, and 18. So what did we get? Well, quite an array of fish, squids, in this case an octopus, uh, siphonophore, jellies, crustaceans galore, uh, larval fishes, this happens to be a small uh, flatfish that is uh, just transforming, as well as normal deep sea residents like this duckbill eel. As far as fish go, and since I'm a fish biologist, I'll speak more to that than the crustaceans and jellies and other things that my colleagues were uh, very interested in. Um, almost 900 species. Now remember when I said at the start that the number of fish species known from the Gulf of Mexico is 1,541. We've collected 900 of them offshore in the oceanic realm. So that's more than 50%. Um, single most abundant thing? This guy here. This is cyclothony. Uh, pallida, this is the pallid bristle now. There are six species of cyclothony in the Gulf of Mexico. And they're all fairly similar in appearance, but basically what these are are like little two-inch anchovies. And they're the food, the forage for so many other deep sea animals, be it squid or crustaceans or fishes. And so that's the most abundant thing that we got. It was almost a third of all of the fishes that we collected was just that species. And if we throw in the other five cyclothony species, that genus accounts for almost two-thirds of everything we caught. There's been some proposals saying that this is the most abundant vertebrate on the planet because when you figure out the actual densities of these and extrapolate to the volume of appropriate depths of water for them, there should be a few trillion of these in the ocean. So that was in line with all of the evidence from other places. Uh, the most a uh, species family was this, the dragonfishes. Uh, this includes all sorts of things like black dragonfishes, the viper fish, uh, star eaters, and all sorts of interesting names because the common names came from scientists instead of the fishermen. Uh, so globally, there's 287 species. In the Gulf of Mexico, we've recorded 111. So almost half of all the diversity occurs in the Gulf of Mexico. That's pretty startling for one tiny little enclosed uh, sea. In addition, there's some endemics. There's some things that only occur in the Gulf of Mexico. Lantern fishes, too. They're very abundant and uh, fairly common. Uh, 62 species here. Fortunately, this is Tracy's group of fishes, and so he's the one who has to deal with these, uh, these little guys because, you know, I can look at all those little light organs there and just barely get them to genus level, but he's got the species down. He can sit there and sort them really fast. Since there are so many different species of fishes, Tracy and I have basically taken the fishes and divvied them up 
And so he works on certain groups, and I work on other groups, and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> so radioid angler fishes. These are more bathypelagic, so these are from the deeper trawls, below uh, typically 1,000 meters, and 61 species, 37 new records for the Gulf of Mexico, and Tracy's identified four that appear to be new species. So, out of the nearly 900 species, 186 are new records. These are things that we knew of from elsewhere in the, the oceans of the world, but first time ever caught in the Gulf of Mexico, which means that that 1,541 species is now bumped up to something like 1,700 plus species. And the groups that have uh, the most new records, the angler fishes, the black dragon fishes, and eels. Um, that was one of the groups that I worked on. And so I, I've uh, become an expert on leptocephaly, eel larvae, because that's what you get in the mock nest. You don't get the full-grown adult eels and all you know, wiggly and big. No, you get things that look like pad thai noodles. And <laughs> you have to figure out what they are on the basis of uh, vertebral counts and all sorts of other things. So looking at the different fish orders that are out there, um, these four orders are fairly well known as speciose deep sea groups uh, in oceans around the world. And so it's not surprising they rank pretty highly in the Gulf of Mexico as well. And so it's... Uh, all the stomiaforms, all the things with these light organs on the belly and such, the nyctophids, the lantern fishes with lots of light organs on the sides, uh, these ridge heads, big scales, all sorts of other crazy names for them, and then uh, this really diverse group, the elopiforms, that include all these lizard-like fishes and things with really big teeth. What was surprising is there were some groups that ranked really highly in our catches as well. Persiforms are the more advanced perch-like fishes, and frequently you think of those as the um, nearshore coastal fishes. And in many cases, they were. Uh, the leptocephaly, the eel larvae, they ranked really, really highly. And then flounders, all of the flat fishes and such. Um, Again, larvae in this case, you can see that there's only one eye on this side. Flatfishes go through a really unique transformation of the, uh, the post larvae to juveniles, where basically the, the front of the head twists and brings the other eye over to one side. <laughs> so, Persiforms, third in rank. And that's both in 2010, 2011, as well as 2015 to 2018. And we were getting a lot of things that were definitely coastal species, like butterfly fishes, surgeon fishes, snappers, various kinds of jacks and such. These are pelagic juveniles of what are coastal species. So way out there in the open ocean, we've got reef fishes and coastal species hanging out. And then the eels, where, you know, 116 species identified so far. Only seven of those species are actually deep water pelagic things. The other, you know, what, 109 species? are coastal or bottom species. And some of them are deep sea bottom species. Um, but a lot of diversity out there. And I'm working on a paper with this title, Hiding in Plain Sight, because they're collected commonly, but people don't actually take the effort to try and identify what they've collected. And so they're overlooking a whole swath of diversity that they would otherwise know. Um, at 116 species, we're talking about more than 10% of the overall diversity. And if you just lump those all in as leptocephaly and ignore trying to figure out what they are, you're losing more than 10% of the diversity of your site. 
So one of the things that we're finding is that the Gulf of Mexico, even though you've got all this open deep water off the continental shelves, there's like a pool or reserve of coastal and reef fishes associated with that deep ocean water. And we found that a number of the species had pelagic juveniles that could persist for a fairly long time, apparently, in the, uh, in the deep waters, waiting for ocean currents to bring them back towards the continental shelf, where they could truly settle out and become uh, viable adults and such. This right here, this is a squirrel fish. But they've got this completely different pelagic coloration of silvery with a blue back out in the open waters compared to the reefs where there are a nocturnal red-colored fish. And so this, this is an adaptation for these guys to be able to persist for a very long time uh, out in the open waters. You take a look at the literature on uh, larval reef fishes and such, and they've always figured, oh, the stuff that's offshore, that's gone. It's dead. It's going to die. But this is not actually demonstrating that necessarily. They could persist for months, which means that currents could potentially bring them back into proximity, like the, the Florida Keys and such, and deliver them to an appropriate habitat for them to settle out and colonized. Another project that, that we were doing was taking tissue samples for uh, genetic barcoding. And so a number of the people on that first list of, uh, of co-authors are the geneticists who are doing this. Now what this required and what makes the Deep End project a little different is Tracy and I are always out on the cruises, and we're identifying all the fishes that we can. And so that means that we've got you know, competent taxonomists who can ID this stuff, hopefully correctly, and then give it to the geneticist, who can then turn around and sequence it and compare it to sequences that are already in GenBank and Bold and some of the other databases where uh, these genetic sequences are held. And they come back to us and say, well, you know, you're doing pretty good. You got, you know, 75% right. <laughs> Sometimes it's a matter of, oh, it's this other closely related species. I miscounted this or that. Uh, sometimes it's like, no, I, I, I've done this correctly. And according to the key, this is supposed to be this. And uh, so we've actually discovered a number of cryptic species this way. And so there are some species that are indistinguishable from known species morphologically, but genetically, the geneticists are saying, well, you know, they've got like 5% or more difference on the CO1 gene, which means that these are likely different species. So we're working on that. That'll be an interesting element to uh, this as well. Also, the barcoding project has helped in a, a one problem with the leptocephaly in particular. The transformation between a leptocephalus eel larvae and an adult eel is almost like the transformation between a tadpole and a frog. And it's really hard to put those two together. Frequently what you have to do is raise the leptocephalus in captivity, which is not possible with some of these deep sea things. So how do you figure out what species that leptocephalus belongs to? There's a number of them that are just sort of given placeholder names right now, because we don't know what they belong to. And so Fasciolella, a species C, actually turns out to be a species of Fasciolella we know of already. But it's a bit of a surprise. I have to work on that paper. Um, so this genetic barcoding is actually helping us a great deal in identifying a whole bunch of mysteries amongst the larval fishes that we didn't know what they were, truly. I mean, we could identify them maybe to genus, but not to species. Now the barcoding can give us what species it, it's related to, or it is. Uh, we have potentially at least 20 new species. If we start adding the cryptic uh, genetic species in there, it's probably more like 25 to 30. 
So we've got a lot of work to do on that as well. So one result of all of our work is that over half of all of the fishes in the Gulf of Mexico spend at least some part of their time out in open oceanic waters, far away from the, the continental shelf. And that includes reef fishes and bottom fishes like flounders and such. Another thing that's going on that we were investigating is that in the oceans, you don't see it, but the world's largest migration occurs every day. And that's because there's a number of fishes that, and shrimp and squid and such, that live in this mesopelagic layer, typically in that 400 to 600 meter interval during the day. And then when you get to dusk, they start migrating up to the surface and they feed at the surface at night. And then when dawn approaches, they move back down into deeper waters. And so this vertical migration, this daily vertical migration, twice a day, is done by so many fishes that it's massive. It's just it's out of sight, and people are not aware that this is going on. So we were interested in finding out who's a migrant and what depths that they're living at in, with the mock nest. But we set up our sampling program so that we were sampling at midnight and at noon. And so... By avoiding dusk and dawn, we're not catching them midway in the, in the migration. By doing noon and midnight, we're catching them after they've migrated to the surface, and then once they've migrated down at noon to deep waters where they reside during the day. And from that, we could start putting together vertical profiles of the, the fish species. So epipelagic things, holo epipelagic that live their entire lives in the, in the surface waters, no surprise. Uh, they're basically just in that 200 meter depth strata both day and night. And that includes a lot of larvae as well. But then here are some of the vertical migrants. Uh, this large bristle mouth right here spends most of its day down here, but then the bulk of them are up at the surface feeding at night. There's really abundant food resources in the photic zone, in the upper 200 meters. So they're going up there and they're feeding like crazy and feasting on what's there. But there's a lot of danger during the day. You got tunas and birds and all sorts of other things that could potentially, and dolphins and such, that could prey on these things visually during the day. So for them, it's better to be at depth during the day and away from most of those visual predators. And so here's a lanternfish, same sort of deal, mostly down at depth during the day and mostly at the surface at night. Now, there are some migrants where not everyone participates, not everyone migrates each day. And so we've got this large amount here at depth during the day, but still some at night, but there's also a portion of them at the surface at night. This is what birders are referred to as a partial migration. We're calling it asynchronous dial migration. Um, it's just a portion of the individual population is making its way to the surface. That may very well have to do with how well they fed the night before. And so if they still have a full stomach, it's hardly worth their effort to, and it's a big effort to go from 1,000 meters to the surface um, and then back down to those depths at, at dawn. So just hang out in the, in the deep, digest the food you, you fed on the night before, and let the hungry ones do the migration. And then there are non-migrators at depth. And so this hammer jaw right here, um, day and night, pretty much the same abundances at the, the different depths. Same goes for this uh, hatchet fish. So what does all this mean? Well, the Gulf of Mexico now turns out to be one of four hyperdiverse oceanic areas around the world. And so these four places represent 
unusually high diversity of organisms, deep sea as well as shallow water, in, in these different regions. And the diversity that we're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico is, is pretty extraordinary. Um, I remember first calling this thing right there the funky purple thing. <laughs> Turns out it's a larval shrimp, but it uh, doesn't look like shrimp to me. <laughs> Not at, the, at that stage. So, Oh, some of the other conclusions we can grab from all of this is that the pelagic habitat of the Gulf is integral to the entire ecosystem. You've got you know, reef fishes out in the open ocean shallow waters. You've got connectivity that's going horizontally. Uh, you've got vertical migration, so connectivity that's going vertically as well. And that vertical nature is being exploited by some other larger predators. So here's big eye tuna that was, uh, uh, had a pop-up satellite tag attached to it. The tag allows uh, you know, readings of water pressure and such, and so it can basically tell you what depth that fish was at. And it's doing a vertical migration itself, chasing the food down deep during the day and then back up towards the surface at night. And it's just sort of going back and forth. A lot of tunas and swordfish and other you know, commercial fisheries do this sort of thing, at least into the upper part of the mesopelagic. So again, that connectivity, the things we eat are feeding on some of these deep sea animals that a lot of folks are not necessarily aware of. Okay, remember that map of all of the infrastructure in 2009, that one dark dot right there, that's deep water horizon. Oil exploration has now gone out beyond deep water horizon. Deep water horizon was the deepest of what they call deep water rigs. Now, there's a whole new category known as ultra deep water rigs that are drilling for oil in 10,000 feet of water. And the more they're doing this, the greater the chance that we may have another accident at some point in the future. So because of this work that we've done with ONSAP and, and DPAN, we now have a much fuller quantitative faunal inventory. We, the mock nest nets actually had uh, flow meters on them that allowed us to tell how much water we actually filtered all those animals out of. And so we can actually work out estimated densities of these animals in the entire basin. Um, we have distribution maps, we have time series with the uh, 2010, 2011, and then 2015, 16, 17, 18. Uh, we're, we've got a better understanding of migrations. And so if another spill occurs, we now have baseline information that can be used to compare against what impacts a new spill may have. That has been one of the big problems with our assessment of the deep water horizon impact. There was virtually no quantitative information prior to the spill. And what we see is 2011, we get large abundances of individuals. By 2015 and afterwards, we're not. We're seeing reductions of 50 to 75 percent abundance. What we don't know, because we don't have the pre-spill data, is whether 2011 was a bumper year and so everyone was doing really great and we sampled just at a time when there was huge abundances or whether things have declined since then. All right, so I have a lot of folks to thank. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative was the main funding agency for Deep End. Uh, NOAA Office of Response and Restoration was the funding agency for the NERDA investigation. Various ship crews, uh, LUMCON provides us with the crew for the Point Sur. The University of Southern Mississippi provides the Point Sur ship itself. Uh, Con Shelf Associates actually gives us, uh, rents us the uh, Mach 10 net. And uh, BBC, 
Uh, they came out on one of our cruises to film some material for the Blue Planet 2, and in return paid for a few extra days of at-sea time. And if you want more information about the Deep End work, uh, this website right here, uh, deependconsortium.org, uh, you can go there, click on it. We've got lots of information if you're that interested. And all of my colleagues, uh, we've got, what, uh, about 19 co-PIs from nine or 10 institutions. And, and so it's a, it's a happy bunch. And thank you very much. <laughs>